Last month's Trade Minister Damien O'Connor was in India and then attended the G20 Trade Ministers meeting in Indonesia. He joins me now. Well, let's start with India. You, know, you were talking trade and better cooperation, but is there any sense that we could start trade negotiations at any time in the kind of foreseeable future? Uh, look, we briefly discussed uh, with Priyush Goyal, uh, Minister of Trade uh, and FTA, you know, it's been mentioned in discussions, but, um, you know, they, they are in a bilateral way working with other countries, not in a multilateral forum. They tend to be um, less enthusiastic there. Um, we've engaged with the WTO and, and other areas and IPF as well with India. In terms of direct bilateral uh, I think it is a goal that we can aspire to, but it's not something that we should put a whole lot of work into right at this point. I think they've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, dairy is very, very sensitive, and it would be uh, unrealistic for us to, to start a negotiation and say that we'll forget dairy. I mean, it's our single biggest export. It will always be part of our trade negotiations. But at this point, uh, there's every good reason that we can build relationships uh, through services, uh, technology, um, and other areas that are less sensitive uh, into a huge and growing market. So it was a very good visit. There was a trade mission over there, again, connecting with a lot of business people. And I think we've got good cultural connections to India. I think we can build on those and eventually we'll have a free trade agreement. It is in part, though, it's because we're so, if they're looking just at bilateral deals, that we're so small. So is it? I mean, it's very hard to offer, um, you know, a whole lot to India, um, you know, when we're, you know, five and a bit million people. So, um, but they see the value in being connected to us. And in terms of dairy, it's how we can offer uh, value to in, into their processing, their breeding, their animal traceability. There are many areas uh, that we can work with them on. But in terms of goods market access, um, it'll be a wee while before we get it for some of those sensitive products. So without a free trade, trade agreement, you know, what are the ways that you can help foster more trade, as you say, in areas like services? How, how do you get there? I mean, look, in an area of India, we've been uh, helping grow uh, better quality apples uh, for some time. There's a joint venture with a New Zealand investor uh, in a dairy operation there, working with a whole community, um, producing milk for the local market. Um, there are other areas, Zespri are looking to go into, you know, uh, India, um, as I say, in the services, education. Um, there's a whole lot of things going on there that we can build on. And I think, you know, be in a better position to put a case and say, let, let Let's formalise it through, through a free trade agreement. The absence of an agreement doesn't mean that we can't grow our opportunities uh, into India and their people into New Zealand. Of course, you know, not long ago signed the free trade agreement with the European Union. It has to be ratified. Um, are you confident that's all going to go through? Uh, yes, I am. And there was a committee out here in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't able to meet with them I was away but uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and other colleagues met with them. Uh, very enthusiastic uh, discussions around the value of the agreement for both Europe and for us. It is around the values that we offer. Um, they are seeking to put in place a very high standard trade agreement that lifts uh, you know, our aspirations um, of of their 27 member, member states in, in New Zealand, of course, around uh, things like labour law, um, biodiversity, um, across the whole area, um, animal welfare, um, you know, food safety, all of these things uh, are of concern to a very high value market of 450 million people. They see the value of being connected to us, and I think that we'll, we'll get this through uh, to ratification, but there's still a process underway. Look, given India's away down the, the line yet, What's then, you know, and you've done the deal with Europe, but as you say, still to be ratified, done the deal with the UK. So what's, the, what's next on the agenda in terms of looking at trade negotiations in terms of some sort of free trade agreement? Um, look, we've been uh, talking uh, in the Gulf states. Uh, I visited over there um, last year. That's been a long-running uh it has. In fact, it was you know almost over the line in 2009, but um, for reasons uh, in, in the Gulf, actually, it was kind of put on, on hold. Um, so they came back to us saying we'd like to re-engage. Um, things have changed a lot, so the goods market as offer is, is not quite what it was. Um, and we've got other issues in, in our trade agreements as well. You know, we're seeking through trade for all. So it's a discussion that's ongoing there. We've got the Pacific Alliance going into the, um, into the, 
you know, Latin American countries. So, so we're working on these things, as I say, India. Um, plenty of things to do to actually build on the market access that we've got now. And we've just got to be mindful that, um, you know, the effort that we have, put into new markets might be better put into the existing markets um, and, and we have limited resources in MFAT and ZTE um, and in fact we have a limited ability to provide goods in particular into some of those markets. The area and the potential for services is unlimited um, and, and so those are the new areas of, of opportunity for New Zealand into the future. How, I mean given the global economic uncertainty which seems to be getting worse rather than better. I mean, have you got a sense of what the implications might be for, for New Zealand's trade? I mean, disruption is, is the one constant, I, I think, and for people, if they're travelling individually or they're trying to get goods into market, um, th there are a lot of challenges, and I don't think they're going to go away in a hurry. So it means that we've got to target those high-value markets, so there's some headroom in there for people to incur and, and absorb some of the additional costs that come in transport, you know, container rates, um, shipping that is diverted. All of these things are providing uh, big challenges for people, making it harder, but I can't see that going away overnight. So we've just got to focus on the markets where the opportunities are there, where the value is there, and make sure we can get that money back into the hands of the producers and the, and the people who, who are you know, developing services here in New Zealand. You know, We have no option. We have to trade as a nation. We've got to look outward, and we've just got to adapt to the, the challenges that we face. Just want you to put your... Agricultural Minister's hat on for the moment and just to talk about the announcement around the Centre for Climate Action and the government partnering with a, with a number of agribusnesses. Um, the ones you know, is that it or do you hope to get others involved as it goes along? No, we hope to get others and uh, we, we thought it was important to you know sign the Memorandum of Understanding now to commit um, to one another and leave the door open for others. Look, the reality is that market signals are coming to all of those big players. Uh, you know, a company like Fonterra supplying Nestle. You know, Nestle have, have set down a target uh, for their suppliers um, by 2030 in terms of um, regenerative or organic or whatever. They're all kind of new aspirations for for them uh, to ensure that they remain connected with their consumers. And so with many of the other food products that we're producing and the companies that are part of the supply chains, they have to show that they have a lower carbon footprint. And that's the focus, I guess, of, of the centre, uh, the focus of, of our efforts, because you know when you see what has happened in Florida in the last week or so, um, these are alarming outcomes, um, shocking people into you know the reality of, of climate change. And I was in California, um, Karen Ross, the Secretary for Agriculture there, was saying that, look, what we thought we had 10 years to plan for is upon us now. And so, so that dramatic shift in thinking means that if we can provide the products that show that we, you know, they're lower carbon, we, we, you know, we're doing our bit to try and reduce the emissions in, in the global environment, then that, that should offer us a premium and, and maintain, I guess, the reputation that we've had in the world, and that is you know, safe food, um, good for them, good for, for their family, and good for the planet. I'm, I'm just not clear from the budget and, and the announcements you made. Just how much money in total will the government is the government prepared to put into the centre to match dollar for dollar what the private sector put in? Look, we've, we've announced three hundred and thirty-eight million dollars, and some of it will be in partnership, but some of it will be for other projects. The Global Research Alliance, you know, partnering up across the globe, um, you know, maybe buying in some some research or um, you know some IP that we might require. To, to adjust, to adapt to New Zealand conditions. Um, the door's open um, to all the opportunities uh, and, and some of the work that's going on around the world. And so this 172 million or thereabouts, and it may be more, will, will be the partnership part of, of the, the globe, of the centre. Um, so it's not just limited to this initiative, but others as well. But sorry, the 172 million so far is total government and the private sector? That's right, yep. for this partnership. Um, but there's more money, of course, that government committed over the same time for other things that will be going on. And rolling that out, commercialising it for farm use is really, really important. Uh, it's all very well to develop the R&D, uh, but we've got to commercialise it. I think those are the areas that we've sometimes fallen short of, um, but I think the farmers are, are, are willing to listen, uh, to learn, but they want to know how to adapt and, and how they apply the knowledge on their farms. 
Damien O'Connor, thank you for your time. Kia ora.